Welcome to Unit 2 Cells, Concept 2 Notes, Honors. We're going to be talking about cell transport. So homeostasis, this is so critical for understanding biology. It is the need of an organism to stay stable by regulating internal conditions and keeping things constant. Now, things don't always stay the exact same. A dynamic equilibrium has to be maintained, so it isn't static. Things don't always stay at the exact same, but they stay within a select range. For instance, your body temperature is not always 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's okay as long as it stays within a set range. It may go a little above, a little below, but within the range, it's fine. And we're maintaining things on a ton of different levels. All of these things have to be kept within specific ranges in order to maintain homeostasis. And how do we do that? Well, we're constantly taking in stimuli from our environment and having to respond to them in order to do this. A stimulus is just a change in your environment and the response is how you as the organism changed in response to it as a result of that stimuli. And, or that stimulus, stimuli is plural. And this is something that's gonna, we're gonna talk about all year long. And so how do you do that as an organism? Well, there are these things called feedback mechanisms that, that have evolved to help us maintain homeostasis as we take in stimuli and respond to them. Essentially, the output of our system is going to signal some sort of change in the input. Either we're going to stabilize or we're going to amplify a response. And these can be done positively or negatively. So a positive feedback mechanism is also referred to as a positive feedback loop. Essentially, the output of the system is going to intensify the response. We're going to cause an amplification. An example, human childbirth. So when the birthing process starts happening, when it's time for the baby to be born, hormones get released that cause your uterus to contract. And those contractions create a ton of pressure. That pressure causes the release of even more hormones, which causes more contractions, which causes more pressure, which causes, again, the release of more hormones. It's this amplification, this positive feedback loop to keep going and going and going until the ultimate result, which is the baby's born. Another less traumatizing example is fruit ripening. So um, if you've ever just had like a bunch of grapes or a bunch of bananas on your you know, kitchen counter, as fruit ripens, it releases ethylene, which signals the surrounding fruit to start ripening. So those fruits start ripening, so they start releasing ethylene, which is going to signal more fruit to ripen. So they kind of keep encouraging each other. They amplify that response, so they all keep ripening. Those are positive feedback loops. Negative feedback loops are where the output causes a counter response to return to some sort of set point. There is a stabilization. So when you think of human body temperature, thermoregulation, it's 98 degrees where I live right now. Um, the heat index is like 107. So if I walked outside, within a few minutes, my body temperature would get very high and my body would sweat in order to help cool it down and lower that temperature again. So the output is going to try to bring me back to my set point or my normal body temperature. This is how water concentration and osmoregulation happens and blood sugar regulation as well. So homeostasis is maintained through regulation at an organ system level for the organism all the way down to the cellular level. And at the cellular level, that's happening because of the cell membrane controlling what goes in and out of the cell. And this is so important. This is how feedback mechanisms are maintained um, is through this cell membrane. So the cell membrane is selectively permeable, meaning it's picky about what it goes in and out of it. And it, this is because of that phospholipid bilayer with the hydrophilic and hydro, hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails. It makes it so it can be picky about what comes in and out. So what can go through easily? Well, small molecules can get through easily. Nonpolar can get through easily. Um, hydrophobic as well or, and or neutral. Water, even though it's polar, it can get through easily because it's really, really small. In large amounts, it's going to have to move through something called aquaporins, but just in small amounts, it can pass easily. 
What cannot get through easily are polar molecules. The polar ones cannot get through these nonpolar tails. They can't do it. That thick barrier right there, they can't do it. And large molecules, they can't squeeze through either. So they need help to get in and out of the cell. And because some things can pass easily and some can't, transport of things in and out of the cell is either considered to be passive or active. Passive transport means it requires no extra energy by the cell. Things are going to move from a high concentration, meaning really squished together, to a low concentration, so spread out. And it's gonna, that means it's moving down the concentration gradient from high to low. So think about when you sit at the top of a slide on a playground, you're at the high part, it's easy to just go down to the low part. It doesn't really require any energy for you to slide down because gravity brings you down from high to low. That's what passive transfer is. We're moving high to low, no extra energy. Simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis are the three types of transport we'll talk through that are like this. Now, active transport requires extra energy in the form of ATP to be spent so that we can bring things either into the cell or expel things out of the cell because we're moving things from low to high concentration. We're going against that gradient. Think about when you're standing at the bottom of the slide and you want to get to the top. To move from the low part of the slide to the high, you're going to have to exert energy to do that. It's not going to naturally happen. And that's how active transport is as well. Examples we'll talk about are molecular pumps, exocytosis, and endocytosis. Okay, a couple words to know before we go any further. A solute is what gets dissolved, the solvent does the dissolving, and then the solution is the uniform mixture of the two. So solute could be like lemonade powder, solvents, water, and think of the solution being the actual lemonade. I review those words with you from unit one because of the relationship with the word concentration. Concentration is the amount of solute that's dissolved in the solvent, and we use brackets to abbreviate the word concentration so we're not having to constantly type that. So something that is highly concentrated, think of highly concentration, concentrated lemonade would have a ton of lemonade powder. It would be really sour, really strong, whereas low concentration would have low lemonade powder, low solute, so it would be really watery. So that gradient is the difference in concentration of a substance between two different locations, and that's what's going to cause either passive moving high to low or active moving low to high. Okay, so we're going to talk through the three types of passive transport now. All of these are moving from a high concentration to a low concentration gradient, so it's not requiring any extra energy. So first is simple diffusion. When you think of simple diffusion, I want you to think of bacon. It's the spreading out of molecules across a membrane until equilibrium is reached. Equilibrium is equal concentration on both sides of the membrane. Molecules are going to have a net movement down the concentration gradient from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So think about bacon. When someone's cooking bacon in the kitchen of your apartment or your house or wherever you live, that smell is so highly concentrated in the kitchen. And somewhere like your bathroom may not smell like bacon at all. But over time, that smell is going to simply diffuse throughout your house until the whole house evenly smells a little bit like bacon everywhere. That's what diffusion is like. And that's how oxygen and carbon dioxide move in and out of the cell, as well as other small nonpolar molecules. They move from the, where there's high concentration to low. So look at this picture. I highly recommend you sketch these in your notes. I made them so simple so you can repeat them in your notes. Draw a dotted line to represent the selectively permeable cell membrane of a cell. So this side has a high concentration of, let's say, oxygen, and this has a low concentration of oxygen. So how simple diffusion works is that naturally these are going to move from high to low. So over time, this will keep happening until the oxygen is equally concentrated in and out of the cell. Facilitated diffusion is really similar. It just needs a little bit more help. So this is where a transport protein is going to help facilitate the diffusion of molecules that normally couldn't pass through the cell membrane on their own. So the protein can act as a channel, kind of like a tunnel that it passes through or it can act as a carrier and it can physically carry the, the substance across the cell membrane. Molecules are still going down the gradient from high to low. 
They're just getting a little extra help from that transport protein. So this is how large molecules like glucose, C6H12O6 move, and some polar molecules like calcium move. So you have that similar picture, but now we have a transport protein. This one's acting as a channel. Things will move from high to low, but through the membrane until over time there we reach that equilibrium on either side of the cell membrane. All right, osmosis. This is the simple diffusion of water across the cell membrane. So everything we've been talking about, we're just specifically going to talk about water moving from high water concentration to low water concentration. So that's the difference. We're looking at the water concentration gradient, not the solute concentration, because where there's a high water concentration, there's a low solute concentration. Think about it. When your lemonade is really watery, has a high water concentration, that means there's a low solute. There's not a lot of lemonade powder and vice versa. So let's look at this picture. Even though the volume of water is the same on either side of the cell membrane, the concentration is not. This is much more watery because look how much less solute is in there. So this is the high concentration of water and this is the low concentration of water. So we would expect the water to move from high to low over time, it would balance out concentration-wise on either side. So let's look at what this looks like in the cell. All cells exist in extracellular fluid, and most of them are mainly water. And so they either can be hyper, hypo, or isotonic. So if I drop one of your cells in a hypertonic solution, that means the solution that your cell's in has a lower water concentration than the inside of your cell, the cell cytoplasm. And since water moves from high to low, it's going to rush out of the cytoplasm, out of the cell, into the extracellular fluid, into that solution. And so the cell is going to shrivel up. If I drop your cell in a hypotonic solution, water is more concentrated outside than inside. So water will rush in because it moves from high to low, and the cell will swell up. I think hypo is like a hippo. It's going to cause the cell to swell up as water rushes in. And if you drop a cell in an isotonic solution, it has identical concentration of water in and out, and so the cell is going to stay the same as water moves in and out equally. All right, let's look at that another way. So hypertonic, the solution has less water than the cell. So the more water in the cell, the solution has less water. So water goes from high to low, so it's going to move out. That's going to cause the cell to shrivel up as it loses water. Hypotonic more water outside in that hypotonic solution than inside. So water rushes in, and that's going to cause the cell to swell up, hypo like a hippo. Isotonic, think I for identical. It's the same concentration of water in the cell as in the solution, and so water moves in and out equally, and the cell size stays the same. All right, let's look at a couple of examples with numbers. All right, so here we've got a cell, and here's the extracellular environment. Let's say inside this cell, the cell's concentrate like solution is the cytoplasm is 80% water and 20% NaCl, sodium chloride, which is salt. The environment it gets put in is 90% water and 10% sodium chloride. So, what type of solution is this cell in? Hyper, hypo, or isotonic? We would say it is the well, first, you could ask, okay, the water's gonna move in from higher water concentration to lower. That means the cell is in a hypotonic solution and that's gonna cause the cell to swell up. All right, this example. There's more water inside than there is outside, so water's gonna move out of the cell. That means the cell must be in a hypertonic environment and that's gonna cause the cell to shrivel up. And then last, looking at these numbers, it's the same, so water's gonna move in and out equally. The cell would be in an isotonic solution, so it would stay the same. All right, last three things we need to talk about are the types of active transport. So these are going to be using energy to move things against the concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration. And one type of that is molecular pumps. This is when a cell is going to use energy to pump molecules against the concentration gradient from low to high, and it's going to do that through a protein channel. And this is how the cell can concentrate molecules on either side or remove a bunch of waste quickly. A bunch of ions like potassium and chlorine and sodium move in this way. So here we have our picture. 
What makes molecular pumps different from facilitated diffusion is it's going to go against the gradient. So we're going to go from low to high, and it's going to take energy to do that. And then over time, we'll have them more concentrated on one end instead of equal on either end. Okay, the last two types we're going to talk about involve vesicles, which are those little carts we talked about in concept one that move things around the cell. Endocytosis, we're going to bring things into the cell using vesicles. This is how white blood cells engulf bacteria in order to fight infections. They bring things in, they um, create the vesicle around the object, and then a lysosome would then destroy it. Exocytosis uses vesicles to export things out of the cell. And so that here's an example of what that could look like here. So when nerve cells secrete neurotransmitters to send signals throughout the body, that's an example of exocytosis. And last, I want to talk about two specific types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis, which is also referred to as cell eating. It's when the cell would engulf a solid into the vesicle and then digest them. And then penocytosis, think cell drinking. The cell is going to engulf liquids into uh, the vesicle and then digest them. All right, I know that was a lot, but I promise we're going to do labs and practice to help you get these sorted out. And we're going to start by organizing our information and summarizing in this table in your notes.